Thank you very much. Awesome stuff. That was incredible, Arnie. I mean, this was an incredible tragedy. 13,000 people lost their lives in this March 11th tsunami. And one of the questions and one of the things I've written about has been a debris field that is now heading across the Pacific Ocean as a result of this tsunami. What do you think the impact of the Fukushima uh, uh, radiation would have on this debris field as it moves across the Pacific? My, uh, my, position, my, my position on the debris field is changing and it's actually getting, uh, getting somewhat worse. Uh, I had thought that uh, most of the debris would uh, have not come from the immediate area of Fukushima. And therefore, um, and when the tsunami hit, it was a good 5 to, uh, to 20 hours between when the tsunami took all this debris out to sea and when the contamination started to come out uh, in, in large quantities. So my original thought was that the debris field wouldn't be too contaminated. But just this week, um, TEPCO announced that they had picked up very shortly after the accident relatively high levels of cesium, uh, 2,000 kilometers, about 1,400 miles offshore. So um, I think that the debris field is going to be carrying cesium uh, across the ocean. It, it might be washed off in the meantime, and, and that's, um, uh, you know, that's uh, going to be something we'll have to find uh, uh, in the future. I'm, I'm really worried more, though, about the, uh, uh, about the fish, especially the ones at the top of the food chain, the tuna and the salmon and things like that. Over the next couple of years, this, um, this cesium will get picked up and bioaccumulate right up the food chain. You know, it's interesting, Arnie. We, we had um, Dr. Jay Nichols on uh, recently, who's a UCSC uh, marine biologist, and, and uh, we were talking about that floating field because there was, in all of these, all of these articles, the news that we get um, appears in one place, one time, and then it's gone. And if you happen to miss that news story when it, when it was registered somewhere, you just don't see it again. But I saw this piece uh, about three weeks ago that was talking about 20 million tons of radioactive debris that was floating in a block toward Hawaii and then headed for the western shores. And, you know, I did some rough calculation with it and was talking with Jay about it a little bit, and, and we said, 20 million tons is essentially enough debris to put a foot deep layer across Rhode Island, Delaware, and the District of Columbia, where maybe it belongs, but that's not where it's going to hit. It's going to hit Hawaii, and it's going to come to the west coast. And uh, when, when did you catch wind of that? Yeah, by, by the way, I have to say thank you for having me. I kind of jumped the gun there. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be on your show. Oh, um, we're delighted with your work and you. It's an honor to have you. The, um, uh, you know, the, what I discovered, uh, well, scientists discovered that the, this cesium that's in the ocean was not spreading out. Uh, you know, the theory had been that the cesium would dilute pretty much uniformly, almost as if you dropped... Uh, you know, some dye into a bottle, over time it would completely be uniform. And that's not happening. It seems to be sticking in the um, ocean currents. And so we're seeing high levels of cesium in the, um, in the ocean currents. And then, you know, laterally to the currents, we're not seeing cesium at all. It's, I think that's a big surprise. We had thought uh, that, the, that the cesium would spread out over the whole Pacific. That doesn't seem to happen. So I think, you know, when the debris field and the, uh, and the cesium that's carried um, in, the, in the ocean uh, hits, it won't be as diluted as scientists had expected it would be. Yeah, that's, that's fearful. And it really, it's an interesting segue. One of the things that Dan has brought for us this evening it's not uh, nuclear waste, but Dan, what would you classify this as? Well, this is, as we know, about 14 billion pounds of trash finds its way into the world ocean every year. And in, the, uh, in each ocean, or each portion of the ocean, Pacific, for example, you have the Pacific High or the Pacific Gyra, where we have a plastic soup that results from these, uh, the materials. And you notice if you, I don't know if you can get a close look at this, but you have very small particles. This is actually a sample 
from the Pacific Gyre. These are very small sample uh, portions of plastic that photodegrade, not biodegrade. They break down into very small parts because of the wind and the salt air and the sun out in the ocean environment. Now, I know that this debris field is, um, is going to take one to three years, depending on the weight, to reach the U.S. So the question is, are we going to see a similar degradation? Some of these materials have been in the gyro for many, many years. What are we going to see as a result of this field? And if there is radioactive contamination in that field, mm -hmm. is that going to also disperse and bioaccumulate, as you were indicating? Yeah, I don't know if you've been following that uh, the uh, gyres that are all over the globe at this at this point, Arnie. But it's kind of like the Dead Seas. You know, we yeah. we, we have uh, 500 of those accumulate uh, around the planet now. Yeah. Isn't that right, Dan? Or that equivalent of the Gulf, but right. replicated um, all, all over the planet right now. And what would be so, as you were talking about earlier, and I want you to maybe explain, how does the cesium get up into the atmosphere? How does it get out, and how far does it travel before it falls in the ocean? What is, what is that path, and what is the impact of that call? Is there something for that process? Well, there's, there's a couple of hundred isotopes um, that, that are released in a, in a nuclear accident. Um, some are um, relatively short half-life, uh, like uh, iodine is an eight-day half-life, so in uh, 80 days it's got to 10 half-lives. Uh, we talk about cesium as if it's the only thing, mm -hmm. but in fact uh, there's several kinds of cesium, 134, 137, and, and there's also strontium and, and other isotopes as well. But what happens is, um, if you remember back in that clip you started the show with, they are in that gap between that little tiny pellet and the rod that fits over it, uh, gases build up. Mm -hmm. And when that rod shatters or when it becomes brittle, almost immediately all of the radioactive gases are released. Those are things like uh, xenon and, uh, and krypton. They're noble gases and they don't react. 100% of those gases were released and, um, over the first couple days of the accident. And then what you're left with is the cesium. And, and other isotopes. Now what, what happens with the cesium is that the um, um, theory was, and, this, and TEPCO is, uh, is still not admitting the severity of the problem with cesium in my mind. The cesium goes into the suppression pool at the bottom of the reactor. But uh, that only holds the cesium and traps the cesium as long as it's below boiling. But we know at Fukushima the water boiled for days. Mm. So all of that cesium that was in that suppression pool can get re-volatilized and the containment was cracked so it went out, it went airborne. The, not just in the explosions, not just in the Unit 1 and Unit 3 explosions, but over a period of weeks those, um, those containments were leaking and the cesium was not being trapped in the suppression pool, a thing called a decontamination factor, DF. The Japanese are assume, assuming 99% of the cesium was left behind and only 1% got released. But in reality, what's happened is when, as long as that water was boiling, which was for the first couple days after that accident, um, all of that cesium was volatile. So it goes up and stays probably in the first seven kilometers, five miles of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, it traveled inland, we all know that, and about now the, the numbers today show that 10% of Japan is contaminated. And it's important to remember that the wind largely was blowing out to sea. This yeah. accident would have been much worse if the wind had been blowing toward uh, the land as opposed to being a, a off sea breeze. So. Um, a lot of it now is in the ocean, and um, an enormous amount is on the, in the mountains. What we're seeing now is the cesium is showing up in places where the plume didn't reach because it's running down the rivers from the mountains and showing up in bays that, in fact, had never seen the airborne uh, cesium to begin with. So it's, it's still spreading. Not, it, it, it hasn't stopped yet. Well, has, has the um, meltdown itself actually stopped? Because I think most people are under the impression, like 
you know, with the Gulf, BP said, oh, it's clean up. It's time to clean up now. And, and everybody's like, oh, great. It's business as, as usual. But we all know that isn't the case. And just recently when the storms went through, all the big tar balls were washing up on out of the sand that they had tried to bury it in. And that hasn't ended at all. So um, what, what is the current status with the reactors as you understand it? Yeah, when you turn a nuclear reactor off, you don't turn it off. You know, it, um, the control rods drop in, and in two or three seconds, 95% of the power disappears. But then you still have 5%. And, and I've explained that as this is a uranium atom. 95% of the heat is liberated when they split, but 5% remains in these fission products. Now we're less than 1%, and actually we're less than a tenth of a percent. But that's still thousands and thousands of horsepower of heat is, is in this molten blob at the bottom of the reactor. The reactor has failed. We're, we're sure of that. And the molten blob has drizzled out almost like um, a soft ice cream onto the floor of the containment. Now, I think it's spread out pretty uniformly on the floor. And there's a large amount of water above it. So I don't think the nuclear core has melted down through the concrete. I hope not. There is a, a gentleman in Japan uh, who's been saying that he expects uh, violent explosions and things like that uh, as this core hits the water table. I don't think that's happening because it drizzled out like, a, like an ice cream and then spread out like a pancake on the bottom. There's plenty of surface area to cool it. But it's still, as you said, it's still creating heat. Those units are still steaming. So what the Japanese are doing is they put a tent around Unit 1, um, not to hide the steam, but to capture the steam and send it up the stack. And over the next six months, they're going to put a tent around uh, Unit 3 and Unit 4 as well. Again, they're going to try to capture it and send it up the stack where it has a better dispersal, it gets to spread out, and it isn't so, um, um, it isn't so local. I hope I answered that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And one thing I wanted to ask you um, before we get too far along in this, and, and our audience, I, I think our viewers are the type of people that totally appreciate and understand what, what it's taking for you to get this kind of information out and that you're an expert witness. You're not necessarily advocating for any specific pos position around uh, nuclear energy, but tell us really briefly your credentials are, and, and why is what you have to say about nuclear power r relevant and, and substantial? Um, well, I have a bachelor's and master's in nuclear from Rensselaer. I was first in my class and uh, first in the nuclear department, 20th out of the whole school. And I had an Atomic Energy Commission scholarship. Uh, I got my reactor operator's license on the research reactor there. Then I worked my way up from, uh, from a cub engineer all the way up to a senior vice president in the nuclear industry for a licensee. I was on the radiation safety committees. Um, I, I, um, I became a nuclear whistleblower in 1990, and the NRC botched the inspection uh, and uh, was taking bribes from my uh, employer. Um, that finally got identified in congressional hearings with John Glenn in 1993. And the chairman of the NRC at the time said, Mr. Gunderson's done quite a service for the United States of America. Um, it, it felt good, but it still, it, you know, I was still uh, labeled in the industry as, uh, as a whistleblower. And then... Uh, yeah, like that's a bad thing, right? Um, it's bad to tell the truth. I had a very famous attorney tell us, uh, uh, Arnie, in this business you're either for us or against us and you just crossed the line. And I, that, that's how it's been since then. And I continue to do expert reports um, Three Mile Island and uh, St. Lucie and Indian Point and the AP-1000 reactor. Uh, and um, uh, I've also been the one who identified the tritium leaks here in, uh, in Vermont. So it's been a 39-year you know, a odyssey. You know, I've got to say one of your favorite quotes and I know Dan has a question for you, but I, one of the favorite things I've, I read from you was uh, sandbags and nuclear power plants don't belong in the same sentence. 